Well, good morning, folks, and it's great to be back in, in Whangarei Church after we had our, um, our first uh, Sabbath in Kaikoui last week. It was a bit different because there's only about 40 people there, but uh, what a goal we have to fill up the pews that aren't full at the moment. So it was a, it was a real joy to be there. We've got a lot to thank the Lord for. He's, uh, he's really blessing our churches throughout the north, and uh, we give him thanks and praise. Through our Adventist net, I had a, a name to look up, uh, and it was Daniel. And uh, this young man sitting over here is Daniel. He's our brother from Romania. And it was his brother and family in Australia that led him to our wonderful message of the Sabbath and, and what we believe. So Daniel is now living in Kawaka. And he's married to a lovely uh, Cambodian lady. Um, and uh, we've been visiting uh, Daniel as we um, zap through Kawakara and back again. So welcome, Daniel, this morning. And uh, just to keep you all happy, you know, my mower is still okay. It's, uh, it's not damaged anyway. Uh, Marianne did a good job with that. But on that token of mowing, uh, it was two weeks ago, two Thursdays ago, where I came home and there was a message on my phone. And it was uh, from, a, from a neighbour a bit further down the road. And uh, she happened to say, look, I don't know what you're, what you're doing, whether you're still doing this, but um, she, could you give me a ring? My husband's gone back to South Africa and uh, the lawns are getting a bit long. So I rang her back and I said, yep, yeah, I'd love to, love to do your lawns for you. That's not a problem. When can you do them? I'll do them Friday afternoon. Fantastic. And then she said to me, I've got something else to share with you. And I go, oh, yeah, what's that? She said, I've been convicted of the Sabbath day. And I went, praise the Lord. And tears just started to run down my face as I, as I heard that good news. And that lady is here sitting next to Marianne today, Lisbeth. And um, she came and opened the Sabbath with us last night to, to see how we do it. And uh, we had a wonderful time of fellowship. So it's great to have you with us, Lisbeth, this morning. But please keep Lisbeth in her prayers because her husband doesn't know about it yet. So please, please pray for Johan. And um, it's great. And, you know, we've got all confidence in God because he answers prayers. Amen. And he's doing a wonderful job uh, through the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. And um, it's great to see, uh, see Chris here again today, too. Um, Chris is that tall chap sitting at the back, at the back, so he doesn't obstruct anyone else's view. Um, Chris, it is, it is a real blessing to have you with us today, mate. So, um, yeah, God is good. Amen. Amen. He's doing a wonderful job, wonderful work. Let us just uh, bow our heads before we look at God's word this morning. Dearest Heavenly Father, we just are so thankful that we can be again in your house this morning. As we look at your word, Lord, we just pray that your spirit will talk to us in a special way so that again we can glorify your name. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just got a scripture reading this morning from the book of Mark. Reading from Mark chapter... 4 verse 40. Mark chapter 4 verse 40. Just a small verse tucked here in the scriptures. Mark chapter 4 verse 40. And Jesus speaking, and he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Why are you fearful? And how is it that you have no faith. I just, uh, I just got to back up and give you this story, actually, of what's actually taken place beforehand here in this particular verse of, of, of the book of Mark, and you can actually read some of it with me. And I want you to, to as, I, as I go through these, um, these verses, just to, just to imagine that you're there. Mary and I had the benefit of being uh, in Israel and where we saw the Sea of Galilee. What a beautiful big sea. No, it's not a sea. It's a huge lake. And um, right tucked in there uh, with the mountains at the, back, uh, at the backdrop, which lead over, over to Syria. And, of course, it has quite a, a um, stony foreshore. So I'd just like to tell the story. And, it's, you know, and I just want you to think it's been a long day as Jesus has been working and preaching along the Sea of Galilee. He's been expounding his parables explaining the kingdom and how we can be part of his wonderful kingdom. For days, he has been ministering to the multitudes and he is absolutely exhausted. We know the picture, eh, when you've been working hard. And even though evening had come, the people, the crowd, 
didn't want to leave. And I can kind of sympathize with these people. When you're in the presence of Jesus, you don't want to leave. When you're experiencing a good thing, you want to keep it going, keep it moving, eh? keep it moving, amen? And this is exactly what these people uh, had experienced that time that they were sharing with Jesus. For days, he had just ministered to them. The man, Jesus, was totally exhausted, and he just wanted to rest. His strength was spent, and it was time to dismiss the crowd and rest. He asked his disciples to take him to a quiet hidden place on the other side of the lake we all know the feeling you've had enough you're tired you've worked all day and it's time to go home or somewhere to chill out and simply rest jesus was just like you and me his human form was tired jesus had been preaching and ministering for days he had given the multitude hours of his time And now he just wanted a quiet place to rest. Jesus asked his disciples if they could quickly just push out the boat into the water and set sail away from the shore onto the lake. And of course the disciples said, yep, no, no, that's not a problem, we'll do that. And of course many of the crowd noticed Jesus stepping into the boat, so they began to fill the other boats that were along the foreshore to follow him. Emphasis on on the word to follow him as we all uh, should be doing. As soon as the boat is underway, Jesus finds a, uh, a, a place at the back of the boat and he lays down and he falls into a very, very deep sleep. As they set sail, it's a beautiful calm night and then suddenly a storm starts to brew. Winds start to howl The waves start growing bigger and bigger. They toss and push that boat all over the lake and waves are pounding over and into the boat. It's as if someone was trying to destroy the occupants of that boat. The waves are so strong that these experienced fishermen are struggling to control the boat, struggling to keep it afloat, The waves are filling the boat faster than they could bail, and the other boats that followed are caught up in this very same storm. And they also fight to keep their own boats afloat. And of course, we know that the disciples are experienced fishermen and sail through many a rough storm on this lake, but all their strength and experience seem to make no difference in the face of this angry storm. They were so busy trying to save the boat in their lives that they even forgot that Jesus was on board. How could you forget that Jesus, the creator and saviour, is on board the boat? Certain now that the lake was to become their dark, watery grave, they cried out to Jesus, recognising that Jesus was their only hope. Master, master, they cried out. Unfortunately, the wind drowned their cries as they yelled and there was no response. With this no response, it led to the, to the next thing of their fears growing and their doubts growing very strong. Was Jesus not able to save them? Did he not care, they thought? They cry out again, but the wind was their only answer as it shrieked around them. Then suddenly, suddenly a flash of lightning pierces the sky, and to their astonishment, there they see Jesus fast asleep. Fast asleep, undisturbed by that same very storm. Master, don't you care that we're all going to die? Were they concerned about what Jesus could do? Or were they only concerned in their own, uh, their own lives here that they were going to die? This time, this time Jesus hears them and opens his eyes. In the glare of the lightning, they see peace on his face. In his eyes, a love for them all. Again, they cry as if Jesus has not yet realized the seriousness of their situation. They cry again, Lord, save us. 
We are going to die. Lord, save us. We're going to die. And you know, that prayer has never, ever gone unanswered. Then and never since then has that prayer gone unanswered. People who sincerely cry out to the Lord, Jesus, save us. He hears them and he saves them. Holding on to their oars and upon every possible fixture, they wait and try to maintain the boat. They are trying to save their boat. Then Jesus, Jesus quietly rises to his feet. And as the winds tear at his robes, Jesus simply lifts up his hands and says, Quiet, he said to the wind, and still to the waves. Quiet, he said to the winds, and be still, he said to the waves. Instantly, the wind stopped and the waves sank. And the cloud dissipated, the boat floated quietly on the waters under a starry filled sky. Jesus asked as the disciples stared, why were you afraid? Don't you have faith? And of course the other boats that were caught up with the storm that had followed Jesus also witnessed this event and the disciples were absolutely speechless. And the people said, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus, when he spoke, was not afraid. It wasn't because of his own power over nature that he did this. No, because he'd already laid down his power when he came to earth. It was because he trusted in his Father, total trust in his Father. Jesus trusted his Father's love and it was his Father's power that quieted the storm. Jesus has a relationship with his Father. His Father, Jehovah God, our Heavenly Father. The disciples could have had the same trust, but they tried first to save themselves. And it was only when they cried out to him for help that he then could help them. And how often do we fall into the same trap? So often we do the same things when the storm of temptation come our way. And how often do they do that? How often are we calling on the name of Jesus to give us that apostolic power, that power that was given to him, as we read in Matthew 28. All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. It's that power that he wants to, us to use, to let it to flow through us. We try to b battle the temptation alone, trusting in our own strength. And as you know, it just never works. As the attraction or current of sin is about to sweep us away, we cry out to Jesus and he always hears our plea. No prayer ever goes unanswered. Maybe it's not when we expect it or, not, or how we expect it to be answered, but Jesus always answers our prayer. As we cry out, Lord, save us, his grace will give us peace and his love will give us hope. Jesus raised his arms and said to the wind, be quiet and to the waves be still. The creator of the world put the elements at rest. Psalm 46 verse 10 also, um, is, uh, also states, be still and know that I am God. As Jesus said to the wind to be still and the waves to be quiet, this verse in the Psalms written by King David says, Be still and know that I am God. We need constantly to spend more time in study of the word, personal devotion and prayer. And what a better time to do that than early in the morning when it's quiet before the attractions of the world have got our attention and time is not ours to have. To be quiet in his presence and still to hear his voice. Create time for this early in the morning. You know, folks, it is time for us more, more than, uh, than what we ever thought before. It's time to have Jesus in our boat. To have Jesus in the boat of our lives, even. If Jesus is not in our boat, we are rowing in circles. 
When we invite him to come into our boat, we go in the same direction, rowing together and yoked together, and claim his promise that he said his yoke is light. The only heavy burden that we carry is the guilt of sin. Give it all to Jesus. He is always waiting to help and quiet the storms of our lives. You know, over the last couple of weeks, I've been praying for a particular issue that's, uh, that's come up and contemplating. And, you know, I've been waiting for the Lord to, to give me an answer in this, uh, in this regards. And as I've waited for the answer, I've only received just two words. Just two words. Repent and be converted. And as I've contemplated these words, repent and and be converted, it reminded me what we've just experienced in the last quarter's Sabbath school lesson, revival and reformation. Why these two words, repent and converted? Ah, then the Spirit gave me the understanding. The person has done the repenting, but no conversion has taken place in their life. How sad is that? Last quarter, that study talked about revival. To Revival brings us to repentance. Reformation brings us to conversion. Change. We need a change in our lives. Today, we should not be the same people as when we commenced last quarter's study. We should be different from then. We should be revived. We should be reforming our lives to the glory of God. And what a wonderful way the Spirit has been poured out upon the world because we see change taking place in people's lives. We all should be experiencing that. We should be all be claiming that not only is that Spirit to be poured out on the world in the 777 prayer, but in our own personal lives. Lord, give me your Spirit should be our prayer. By the grace and mercy of God... We give thanks to the Lord that young Carl Pram is with us still today. And I like to address this to our young people. And as you think of Carl, your, your brother, your friend, your cousin, um, I just want you to think that maybe this is a wake-up call for us all. Not only for you folks, but for us all. Because as you know, some of you have been baptised, as we have all been baptised, and we need to see this conversion in our lives, in your lives, so that people will become attracted to the Lord that we love. And we're just so thankful that Kyle is in a stable condition. It's time to stop hanging on to the world, and it's time to come out of the world. Even though we live in it, we don't have to be a part of it. You and I are not bulletproof. Our lives are so precious and can be taken away in a moment. And you need to get Jesus in your boat. Let's just turn to the book of Acts, please, now. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And it just kind of confirms what I've been mentioning to you here this morning. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And it reads, Repent ye therefore and be converted. Those two words that have constantly been in my mind, Repent ye therefore and be converted. Why? That your sins may be blotted out. That your sins may be blotted out. When the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, when is the time of refreshing coming? Supposed to come? It's coming now as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the world. The time of refreshing. Let's claim the promise of that outpouring. And he says, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before was preached unto you, who the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God had spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. Heaven must retain Jesus until the time of restitution, until all is made good again, and then can Jesus come. That, that time is, uh, is about to expire, that time of restitution, and, uh, and Jesus is about to, to come again. 
We need to actually, as a church, since the last 169 years, since 1844, we've been preaching that Jesus is coming soon. Amen? And I think we need to change that to Jesus is near. Nearer than we can ever imagine. So it's time to, for us to, uh, to put Jesus in our boat. I'd like also just you to, to uh, turn to the book of Mark, chapter 2, verse 1. And I mentioned this to our elders the other night, and, um, and I thought I'd just like to share it with you too, um, to give us some, some encouragement. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. It's just going another side of the story, and it's mentioned in here, and it says, Again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. So people heard that he was in the house. And straight away, many were gathered, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, no, not such as about the door. And he preached the word unto him. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not uh, come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when, he broke it up, and when they had broke it up, they let down the, the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Jesus saw this wonderful faith that these men had, and that's the faith that we need. And as I mentioned to our elders, I says, Are we prepared to go that extra step? Are we prepared to go and uncover our roof to get closer to Jesus? And on a spiritual level, how many roofs have we uncovered to spend time with Jesus. And I'd like to leave that thought with you as we go into our communion service now, that uh, nothing should ever stop us from coming to Jesus, whether it's physical or anything else. Remove it so that we can come to Jesus. As we now move into our communion service, I'd just like, for the, uh, for the sake of those people that are, are new to us today, we have open communion, and you're all welcome to attend um, as you believe in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, I'll just uh, read uh, the verse in Scripture in, uh, in John 13, how Jesus gave us the example. Reading from the book of uh, John, chapter 13, from verse 1. So here we have the story of Jesus who's gone up to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover with him becoming the Passover lamb. And it's, he says to us, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he ra rises from supper, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherein he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter and to Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash not thee, if sorry, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto the Lord, Not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not save his feet, wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, You are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. 
For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are, are you if you do them. This is the example that Jesus has given us, and this is what we'd like to partner out to do, to wash one another's feet. We know where the women are in the conference room, the men in the hall, but before we go, let's just have a word of prayer to close our service this morning, our sermon part of the service. Dearest Heavenly Father, we just so thank you. So thank you, Lord, very much because of the fact that you've given us this wonderful example that when Jesus quieted the storm, Lord, he also said, be quiet and be still. Father, it is in, it is in those, those times of the day when we're quiet and still that we can hear your spirit talking to us, Lord. And we thank you for this message. Heavenly Fathers, we now part to follow the example of Jesus. We ask you to forgive us where we've failed you, Lord, where we've failed one another. And we thank you that we have forgiveness in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that we can be humbled by this service to our brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, team. In the book of John again, in John chapter 6, verse 31 to 35, states simply, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said, to the, said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he that which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, even more, give us this bread. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on him shall never thirst. I'll ask our brother Lou to pray on the bread. Thank you. Shall we kneel in prayer? Heavenly Father, again this morning, we just want to thank you for your love, and your grace for you the example Lord that you set before us in the upper room with your disciples and Lord we just pray that as we humbly come to you at this time that we will recognize all that you've done for us mm. Father again we just ask that you will bless this bread as it represents you and the sacrifice that you made for us on Calvary. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.